The Prime Minister met with her new counterpart in Australia, Albo, as I think we're allowed to call him now, over the weekend, and no joy, it would seem, on the issue of the deportation of 501s. But has the trans-Tasman relationship improved with a change of government? Labor government's on both sides of the ditch now. And where are we at, and are we in concert on the contentious, ever more contentious issue of the geopolitical power play in our part of the world between China and the United States. To uh, probe this, see how the meeting went, we're joined by a mate of elbows, uh, Peter Fitzsimons. Peter, how are you, mate? G'day. Sean, I'm well. All right. Hey, firstly, was this a big news in Australia, the fact that Jacinda Ardern was there, or was it like page seven? <laughs> Look, it was uh, it, uh, let's say page three, not not page one news, but it was it was terrific to see her back. I think that's the first time in two years because COVID stopped all of yeah. that, and the photo that went out of them warmly embracing looked like two old friends catching up, and it was a really warm photo. And certainly the 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 chill between our two countries over. The deportations, it hasn't gone away, but it's certainly warmed up from where it was. You've got two... Well, well did you give us any hope figures. that... Yeah, did you give us any hope that you'd stop uh, dumping the New Zealand board scumbags back here? <sighs> Look, the... I speak as one who... I, I did a story for the ABC's foreign correspondent on that. And the starting point is, it is ridiculous. I mean, in the, when I did it in 2018, in the previous three years, we had sent you 1,800 New Zealand-born people. You'd sent us back nine the other way. It was totally out of kilter. And as I wrote in the Sydney Morning Herald at the time, we can't beat our chest at Anzac Day and say, our brothers and sisters, our cousins across the Tasman, we love the Kiwis, they love us and then treat them in that cavalier fashion. I was a bitter critic of it then. I'm a bitter critic of it now. The political situation with Anthony Albanese is I'm, I've got no inside information at all. But the, what, I, what I see and what I read, they know that that's out of kilter. They know that that's ridiculous. On the other hand, they've got to be careful. They can't, they can't come in and just go, OK, it, we, we stopped, we've stopped all that. I mean, the thing that really stunned me with a number when I went to New Zealand I went to Auckland I went to Wellington with the camera crews in tow and I remember there was a fellow I think his name was Nick and he came from Byron Bay and he'd married an Australian woman and he had two Australian children and he was he was an Australian he was absolutely not quite born and bred Australian because he was on a Kiwi passport but he'd never he'd never gone he'd never you know gone to the effort of filling in the paperwork, but he w he had some criminal past. I don't think I don't remember it being too heavy. But what I remember thinking is this guy was our creation. Whatever the whatever the character problems, whatever the criminal problems, he was a problem born of Australia and we were dumping him on Kiwi shores. And I remember leaving him on the ramparts there by Auckland Harbour as he wandered along thinking, this is not right. And how difficult it is for this guy who was calling his children twice a day. And that situation is not right. But the politics of it are the new leader of the Liberal Party, Peter Dutton, you know, they are able to say, tough on crime, tough on criminals. We send criminals back to... We send criminals back to New Zealand. You describe them as New Zealand scum or Australian scum. A lot of the people I talked to were not were not scum. They were people that had made wrong choices, done the wrong thing here and there, but they weren't hardbound criminals. They weren't. They were. They were people that were doing it really tough, and they found yep. themselves, you know, in a political fulcrum where it was. And Peter, just fair to say, call. I was being. I was making a gross generalisation. So yeah, it's cool. not like you, um, Sean, to pull back. That's not like <laughs> you to apologise. I am a man. I am a mild-mannered man, often misinterpreted. Look, I want to talk... Let's keep talking about gangs, though, if we can quickly. So we've just had the National Party here come out with a four-point plan to rub out the crims and get tough because an election's coming and they've been polling. They've held up West Australia's attitude to gangs as the be-all and end-all, without actually, it would seem, in some instances, even looking at our existing laws in New Zealand. But particularly, and I think the, the centrepiece of this, the starring role in their Get Tough on Gangs, is the banning of gang patches and insignia in public places. 
and they say West Australia's done it and it has worked to charm. Is that the truth? Well, it's interesting that they should say that. I'm an Australian. I read the news every day. Uh, you know, I'm sort of a bit of a news junkie. When you talk about repressing gangs in that manner, I'm much more associated with Queensland and the former Premier Campbell Newman. Um, you know, he came in on the usual platform of law and order. And as soon as he came in, they, there was all of that kind of banning of patches, banning of congregation. And the issue was, you know, breach of civil liberties and the rest. And all I can say is with Campbell Newman, two things. One is gangs, bike gangs in Australia just seem to be far more prevalent than they used to be. But Campbell Newman was the rarest example in Australian politics where one term and completely and utterly wiped out. OK, but did he get gang crime down? Did he get gang numbers down on his state? I'm not an expert in the field. I would certainly say that gang yeah. visibility has diminished. Yeah. All right. All right, Peter. Well, let's move on to the other stuff that our Prime Ministers would have been talking about. And I think mm -hmm. we are now all aware that we are almost in a DMZ, as it were, um, between the two remaining superpowers, China and the United States. And the Chinese, mm. and I'm not going to pass judgment on it, so they are clearly saying we would like to spend more money um, in uh, our part of the world with aid and everything. We'd be naive to think that doesn't come with strings attached and the Americans seem concerned about that. We're having some debate here, and I say some debate because I don't know that it's widespread, as to where we sit in this Cold War in a warm place. Are we with the Chinese, now our largest trading partner, or are we with Uncle Sam that came down and saved our butts in, in, in World War II? I get the perception that Australia is USA all the way, and are New Zealand and Australia in concert on this or not? The Australian position is very much, it was best enunciated by the Australian Prime Minister, Harold Holt, in 1966, said all the way with LBJ, referring to That's the American right. president. That was basically the Australian foreign policy, to which the opposition leader, Gough Whitlam, famously said, it's all very well saying all the way with LBJ, so long as you know where LBJ is going. And <laughs> the policy of Australia on America, uh, you know, foreign policy has nevertheless not really changed in the last 50 years. We we have tended to do whatever the Americans want of us. We look to America. I mean, the, the famous line, when, when, when Australia went to the First World War, the Australian Prime Minister, Andrew Fisher, said, we will fight for Great Britain to the last man and the last shilling. And then after the, and we did that, and we lost, we, we, we lost mm. 62,000 Australian soldiers, 47,000 in, in, in France. In not going into the Second World War, Curtin, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December, 41, on New Year's Eve, coming into 42, John Curtin, the Prime Minister, said, without any pangs as our traditional kinship and tradition with the UK, I'm, we make it clear we look to America and that's been our policy ever since and we've famously in recent times did the Australian United Kingdom American policy which basically binds us binds us to all of them we ditched France and we look to China with some alarm the the in the Solomon Solomon Islands and the rest of it but it's it in us from an Australian perspective it's something that Australian politicians have beat the drum on the general population. We look to the we look to the Solomon Islands. We look to the encroach encroachment of China in the area, thinking, geez, that doesn't that doesn't that doesn't look really very good. But it's not something that is a, a topic of daily conversation. As to New Zealand, mm -hmm. uh, I said this on radio the other day. It always seemed to me that when I would go to Auckland pre-COVID and Wellington and so forth and lovely Christchurch, whereas Sydney Sydney is probably 22,000 kilometres from London, it always felt to me like Auckland was maybe 9,000 kilometres. It always seemed to me in New Zealand you have a, a far stronger natural affinity for Great Britain than we do. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be true and, and, and a, a absolute uh, observation. <laughs> 
Do you think, and are Australian people concerned about the Chinese goodwill incursion or aid incursion or support incursion into <coughs> your part of the world? I'm sorry to be copying in your ear. It's post-COVID. That's all right. That's <laughs> but, all right. Uh, yes. Look, we, we're we're concerned, and but as I, as I said, it it's a gr- look. In since the new government's taken over, we've got the new foreign foreign minister. Uh, there was image of him last night sitting down with his Chinese counterpart. There seems to have been some thawing in that relationship. But, I mean, it, it was fascinating. In this last election, which I'm sure you followed closely, the the Prime Minister and the now Liberal leader, Peter Dutton, all but said that, well, they, they accused Anthony Albanese of, of doing things at the behest of China. To which, you know, like almost the Manchurian candidate, this is China's yeah, yeah. favourite candidate. It was pretty hard heavyweight politics. To which the point was made, hang on a bloody second. It was on the, under the watch of Scott Morrison that, that Darwin was leased to, the port of Darwin was leased to China, I think, for 99 years, as was the port of Newcastle. I mean, you, and, and just prior to the election taking place, there was the alarm, you know, there's a Chinese warship off the coast of Western Australia, to yeah. which the point was made, well, it's probably going to refuel in Darwin. You know? well, see, I, I must admit, it, 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 <laughs> yeah. Peter, I'm saying New Zealand, what New Zealand should do. This is a classic thing. We've got two buyers on Trade Me, and they're both rich and influential, right? And I say, we say the port of Whangarei, north of Auckland, deep water port, right? You can have a Chinese naval Whangarei. base there or an American naval base there, and they'd both want it. We know they'd both want it. So we say, who is prepared to build more infrastructure for New Zealand and will give you a naval base there? Surely that's what every small Pacific nation should be doing, is playing these superpowers off against each other for their benefit. Can I give you the alternative, yeah? Yeah. Do you really want infrastructure in New Zealand? You have one of the most physically beautiful places on earth. When I go particularly South Island and certainly up to Whangarei, I look at it with stunned wonder. The, in the Western civilizer, in, w- in the Western world, the concept of heaven is rolling green fields, snow-topped mountaintops, happy shepherds in the, in the fields waving as you pass. And when you drive from Ranfurly down to Omaru, that's what it looks yeah. like. Yeah, you know, and, but and, the other problem is you go to the I North Island, it. worst statistics for uh, hospital care, health care, um, uh, education, no high-speed broadband or internet, moribund economies. That's what we need infrastructure for. And I know you would like to come over to New Zealand, look at all these nice surfs tugging their forelocks, living in kind of rural, rural ecstasy and chewing on the, on, I don't know, pieces of hay and straw, and go, wow, good to see you, oh, a lovely day, you know. We actually have to have a country that goes forward, Peter, and isn't just, you, you know, a picture postcard for Hills, people right? like... You wouldn't... With, no, I don't live north of the attitude, Bombay Hills, I live south. <laughs> I live in Wellington, you well, know. You sound like north of the Bombay Hills with that attitude to the fine people of the South Island. Well, <laughs> we've got a studio in the South Island. Hey, look, let's get back to where we started. Do you think, um, apart from the photo op, is there a new kind of friendliness, understanding yes. between Canberra and Wellington? You reckon there is? Totally, absolutely. I mean, basically, we have a natural affinity between we Australians and New Zealanders, and it's been a bit grim in the years of the Morrison government, led by that whole thing of, you know, deporting so many, so many basically Australian-born yeah. problems to New Zealand. But you still are budging on that policy. Not right, and it should change. Sorry? Yeah, well, and, but that hasn't changed, and I guess that's the thing we're going to get bang on about here until it is. Hey, always good talking, uh, Fitzy. You, thank you. Yeah, right. you can tell me. Thanks, Sean. Go Bye-bye. ahead, we've got time. No, no. Well, just, okay, well, I'll say this. There was a really interesting thing the other night with uh, Chris Bowen talking about what are you going to do about this what are you going to do about that he said i'm not sure what we're going to do but i can tell you this we won't be doing it for the 24-hour news cycle we're not going to try to win the evening news every night we're going to get the best brains in the business we're going to work it out we're going to work out what the best policy is and with uh, there is that real sense now with i mean with this issue issue as all others it's not going to be done in 24 hours but it will i would suspect and i repeat i have no inside knowledge um 
but I would suspect things will sort out in months to come because the policy. And I'll tell you what, Peter, I, th- I, I think, yeah, I think sorting it out because, as I said, um, the tide is going out on the Labor Party here, and one of the big issues is law and order. So if an Australian Labor government were to deliver a political win for Jacinda Ardern on the issue of 501s, that might have some significant impact on domestic political polling here. Just an observation. Here's my observation. We look across the ditch at your government and go, you know, for in, my, in my view... Your government is a, is a, fig, uh, is a government of... We, I mean, we have been envious of your government for some time, you know, and we've been envious of your politics. You seem to lack... We've had shock and vitriol, nastiness. And, you know, New Zealand seems to... You've got a good government and you, the way you do your politics seems to be a far more... Not genteel, but you don't have, you know, the nasty factional carry-on. And the problem you don't in have New Zealand is that... Blasting yeah. away. Peter, if you're nasty to someone in New Zealand in politics or any field of life, the likelihood in the country the small is that you're going to bump into them in the supermarket next weekend. So you've got to be careful. Yeah. All Good right. on you, mate. Thank you Good for talking. Good Cheers. Uh, that is uh, Peter Fitzsimons uh, checking in from Australia. He does. He's got a lovely golden view of, of, of New Zealand. And I quite like his optimism uh, in some ways.